Welcome back to Joint Decisions. We're glad to have you. This is a program that's dedicated to educating and empowering people who live with moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis, and it's sponsored by Janssen Biotech and Creaky Joint. The goal of the program is to provide people who are living with RA and caregivers some tools and some resources that they need so they can have an active role in managing RA. And just a little, you know, Disclaimers we always give, the educational content of this web chat is not intended to be taken as medical advice, and it should not replace the recommendations and the advice of your doctor. Any questions that you have that are specific to your health or your medication should be discussed with your own health care provider. And participants in today's chat were compensated for the time that they spent collaborating on the content for the Joint Decisions Program. I'm Dr. Laurie Ferguson. I'm a health psychologist and I work with creakyjoints.org. We like to think of ourselves as a vibrant online community for the support and empowerment of people who live with RA and related diseases. Um, if you haven't yet joined us, come on over to creakyjoints.org and sign up. There's lots of great information and support and advocacy that we provide through our community. So in our first web chat, we talked about how important it is to be treated by a rheumatologist for the management of RA, and we gave some tips on how to make the most of your time with your rheumatologist. And we also had the pleasure of speaking with a TV host and comedian, Matt Eisman, about his experience living with RA, and Matt has come back to join us tonight. Hi, Matt. Hey, Lori. How are you? I, I, I'm thrilled to be back for another joint decisions chat. During the last web chat, I actually talked about how I was diagnosed with RA several years ago, and I was in really bad shape. Uh, but then I started working with a rheumatologist, and we came up with a plan to effectively manage my RA, which included finding the right medicine. And it's really been such a, a big change in my life since then. Mm. Oh. Well, we're going to be excited to hear more from Matt throughout the chat. This chat is titled, Know Your Options making informed decisions about the RA treatment. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about, how to find those right treatments. You know, we know, unfortunately, there is no cure for RA, but medications can help reduce the inflammation in the joints, and that can sometimes relieve the pain and the stiffness. And some have been shown to even prevent or slow joint damage. So it's important to know that there are many treatments available to you and your rheumatologist. And in this chat, we're going to discuss some of those types of treatments, but we're not going to discuss specific brand medications. We're also really excited tonight to welcome Dr. Rebecca Callis. Dr. Callis is a board-certified rheumatologist at River Valley Rheumatology and Infusions, and she's come on to the chat today to help us understand some RA treatments and how they work to manage and control symptoms. Welcome, Dr. Callis. Hi, Dr. Ferguson. Hi, Matt. I'm Rebecca Callis. I'm a board-certified rheumatologist, as she said. I practice in Salem and Eugene, Oregon. Um, originally, I was trained at Washington University in St. Louis for my residency and fellowship for rheumatology, and I'm really happy to be here today with Joint Decisions. I'm very passionate when it comes to patient education, so I think that it's very important to give you the best results that you can have when it comes to treatment of your rheumatoid arthritis. So I'm really happy to be here today. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Callis, and thank you, Matt Eisman, for joining us today. So we're going to get started, and here's um, a snapshot of what we're going to discuss. First of all, some RA treatment options. Um, we're going to talk about the benefits of having those treatment choices, and then how you work with your rheumatologist to decide which treatment option is right for you. Now, we want to hear from you throughout the discussion. So if you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A feature, and that's located in the toolbar at the top of your screen if you're in full screen mode or on the right side if you're in the split screen mode. Please be sure to submit your questions to all panelists, and we're going to get to as many of those as we can in the time remaining at the end. And in your questions, we're going to ask you again not to mention specific brands of treatment, but also, those of you who may be tweeting, if you'd like to share links and spread the word about the, chat, the content of the chat tonight, we're using the hashtag joint decisions. So 
That's about submitting your questions that we will be collecting and answering at the end, as many as we can get to. We're also going to be asking some poll questions so we can get a sense of what's going on with you and you can with the other people who are participating. We're going to do that throughout the discussion and get your feedback. And so here's our first poll question. You're going to see that appear on the right-hand side of your screen. So the question is, true or false? Joint damage from RA is reversible with the proper treatment. Again, I'm going to ask you to click true or false. And after you make your selection, please hit the submit bot button, and that's at the bottom of your screen. So true or false, joint damage from RA is reversible with the proper treatment. And then just don't forget to click submit on that button. And we're just waiting here to get the result. Thanks everybody for taking the poll and submitting. We're going to see in just a moment. So 10% of our participants think that joint damage is reversible, while 90% think it's not reversible. And the fact is, that's true. Joint damage is not reversible. And that's why it's so important to work with a rheumatologist to find that treatment option that's going to work to control the RA and potentially prevent it from causing further joint damage. And for most people, appropriate early treatment can control the joint pain, the stiffness, and the swelling. And then that helps slow the joint damage. So Matt, you've lived with RA for a while. What went through your mind when you were diagnosed knowing that this is a progressive disease and that it can lead to that irreversible joint damage? Well, learning I had a diagnosis of RA certainly was difficult, but at the same time, there was a sense of relief because I finally knew what had been causing my body to fall apart for the, for the prior year and a half. Uh, the good news is for people who are diagnosed today, there are so many treatment options available for people with RA that can help you manage the disease. And uh, that's why I think it's so important for people to participate in events like this to learn about all these treatment options. I know the way I was feeling, I wanted to act quickly. So my rheumatologist and I came up with a plan and we determined a treatment that was best for me that was really based on a lot of factors, including my overall health, the condition I was in, and the safety of the medication as well as the treatment goals we had. Um, but for me, I really, I like being here, uh, sharing my story so I can show people you can live with RA and this disease does not have to control your life. And Matt, we so appreciate that. I think that word irreversible can be so scary. And so we really want to emphasize the word manage. Um, and I think as you tell your story and talk about it, we're really talking about how we manage and that RA can be managed. Um, and the other thing that I think your story really helps us kind of underline is how can you be your own advocate and work closely with the rheumatologist to manage your health now and then that leads into the future. So Dr. Callis, as you know, as you're listening to this, I know you're probably ready to talk to us about all those different kinds of treatment. But before we get to that, what are some of those key points that people should keep in mind when they begin to discuss the options for treatment? for their moderately severe or active RA when they're going to talk to their rheumatologist? That's a good question. Uh, you must have been talking to my husband to figure out I always have something to say, which is always definitely true. Um, it is important to remember there are many different medications that are available for treatment of your rheumatoid arthritis, and there's not a one-size-fits-all medication, unfortunately, when it comes to the disease. So we can't predict which medications are going to work for you and which medications aren't. It's important to remember because there's not that one size fits all uh, medication for the disease that people in the same family might actually respond differently to different medications. So for example, I have many family members that are on different medications for control of their arthritis, whether that be mothers and daughters, grandmothers and grandchildren. It's important to remember that there's many personal factors that come into account on which medication that together with your rheumatologist choose for treatment of your rheumatoid arthritis. So it's very important to be honest with your rheumatoid arthritis and tell them about your current and past medical history so that we can make the best choices for you. 
if one medication doesn't work, don't worry, we'll try different ones. We don't have any ability to be able to predict which medications are gonna work, so we'll just go through the list of the typical trial and errors. Um, it's important that, uh, that you overview all the different medication options before starting them with your rheumatologist and talk about the potential side effects. Later on today, during this little joint decision tra uh, chat, we're gonna talk about some other medication options of which you might have for treatment of the moderately to severe active rheumatoid arthritis. Wow, so what you're really saying is we shouldn't come in to talk to the rheumatologist with a preconceived idea of what the medication or the treatment should be. You know, based on somebody we know or somebody we love, a family member, we should really be open to hearing all the options for us and understand there might even have to be some trial and error to get the right thing to manage it for us. So what we're gonna to turn to another poll question. So a family member might be somebody who's influenced your treatment decisions. Um, of the options on your screen, let's think about who has had the most influence on your treatment decisions with your rheumatologist. So you can see these options in front of you. So what's the influence of your rheumatologist recommendation, information that you may have gotten from your rheumatologist's office, Recommendations from another healthcare professional, a nurse, a pharmacist, a primary care physician. Have you been influenced most by a friend or a family member's recommendation? Or have you been most influenced by your own research? Or maybe there's something we haven't thought of. So again, I'm gonna ask you to make your selection and then hit that submit button at the bottom of the screen. So again, who has had the most influence on your treatment decision with your rheumatologist? rheumatologist, information from the office, recommendations from another healthcare person, a friend or a family member, your own research, something we haven't even imagined, the other. So here we've got the poll back. So 60% of you said that it was your rheumatologist recommendation that had the most influence. 13% of you got that influence from some information from the rheumatologist's office. 7% based your treatment recommendation, the influence, on a recommendation from another healthcare professional you work with. Nobody took their friend or their family's recommendation. And 20% of you really relied a lot on your own research, which I think is commendable when we're talking about managing, being willing to do that research and dig in to be your own advocate. So we, we have an idea now how we get information, and tonight we're gonna to get some information specifically from our own rheumatologist, Dr. Callis. Can you explain to us how that moderately to severely active RA is treated? Yes, uh, another good question. And once again on that poll, I'm very happy to see that many patients do a lot of research when you're considering a medication. That's very good. But basically, it's important to remember that early diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis is very critical. So if you think you have some rheumatoid-related disease, it's important to be evaluated by your physician for such. When we start treating patients with uh, moderate to severe active rheumatoid arthritis, we often usually start with medication called a DMARD. A DMARD stands for a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. There are many different types of DMARDs. The most typical DMARD we use is methotrexate. Methotrexate is only taken one time a week no matter how you get that drug. So that drug can be administered by an injection, a sub-Q injection in the doctor's office or by yourself at home, or it can be taken as pills, but it's always important to remember it's only one day a week. Those medications are meant to help control the signs and symptoms and hopefully prevent or at least slow down the damage of rheumatoid arthritis. And as we talked about before, unfortunately we cannot fix the damage that's already done. These medications, uh, if they work, you remain on them, but if not, we can consider other medications such as biologic medications. Biologic medications are different than the DMARDs. Those are basically humanly engineered proteins that target another protein in effort to further reduce the immune system and therefore control the signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis and hopefully prevent further damage. So those biologic medications, if you do progress to those after the use of a DMARD, usually work better in the setting of a DMARD, typically methotrexate. So we often use those medications in combination. 
Okay, thank you. The, we're we're going to be getting a lot of information here, and I'm just going to remind you all that that this will be posted on the Creepy Joints website. So if there are things you missed, you might be able to come back and listen to it again. And I'll also remind you that if you want to submit a question that we're going to deal with later, nothing about a specific brand, but we do want to hear your questions. Again, you're going to go to the top of your screen and um, click for all panelists and we'll get to as many of those as we can. So, Dr. Callis, you brought up the biologics. Can you explain how a patient might start on a biologic medication? Yes, yeah, so the, the most typical biologic medications we see patients start on is a TNF inhibitor. TNF stands for tumor necrosis factor. So basically, these are humanly engineered proteins that eat another protein. The way I describe it to my patients is kind of like Pac-Man, actually. In patients with rheumatoid arthritis, you make too much of this protein called TNF. That TNF at high levels promotes inflammation, pain, and stiffness into the joint. So what we do with these medications is we try and, for lack of better words, kind of eat that protein or neutralize that protein. So like I said, it's like Pac-Man. You make the dot and I give you the medication, the TNF inhibitor, that tries to eat those dots and therefore neutralize those proteins. There's many different proteins other than TNF inhibitors that can be uh, attacked when coming to talk about rheumatoid arthritis. So other biologic medications, instead of going after the protein TNF, may go after other proteins such as interleukin-6 or T-cell co-stimulation, or CD19 positive B cells. So it's getting a little technical and I'm not gonna give you a full biochemistry lesson, so don't worry, and no reports are due at the end of this little lecture. But basically, biologics are proteins used to neutralize other proteins that promote inflammation, okay? It's important to remember that these medications can have side effects. So there are appropriate screenings that your rheumatologist needs to do with you before you initiate these drugs. Those screenings we'll talk about here in just a little bit, but it's, it's, it's important to be honest with your rheumatologist regarding your current and past infections, whether that be things like hepatitis, TB, or whatever. We hope you do well on these medications, and it's important that even if you do do well, to still come back to the doctor and let us know, because part of the screening is not just labs or x-rays or things like that. It's us physically looking at you to make sure we don't find other side effects of these drugs. Okay, thanks. So, you know, it is a little technical, but you know, we've got people here who do a lot of research, so it's great to give the information. So, the next question I think that, that comes to us is, okay, so how are the biologic medications taken? What's that? How are they administered? Okay, yet, yet another good question. There's basically two main ways that biologic medications can be administered. The first one is by an infusion, or the medication is given by vein. So basically you go to a trained healthcare professional, whether that be an infusion center or a hospital or your rheumatologist's office, and they, they basically hook you up to like an IV bag with a little hose and start a, a, usually a catheter into your, to your vein to administer the drug. And uh, this should always be done by a trained healthcare professional to look for side effects. The second way these biologic medications can be administered is by subcutaneous injection. So basically, that's by a shot, okay? Um, that is a shot into the soft tissue or the fat of your skin, and usually these needles are really, really uh, pretty small, not very long, and relatively superficial. These shots can be administered by your physician at the physician's office, or they can be administered by yourself at home, obviously after appropriate training from a medical professional. And obviously, if you have any questions regarding if you're doing a good job with your injection, you should contact your rheumatologist for further instruction of this. The frequency of how often you give yourself the injection or the frequency of how often you get the IV medication obviously depends on which one you're on. Also, the length of time it takes to get the IV medication obviously depends on which one you're on. So, uh, getting these medications and how they are delivered to you is, a, is another question that gets brought up in this subject. When you get these medications by vein, the infusion center takes care of it. You don't have to bring them in. When you get these medications by subcutaneous injection, you can get them in two places. One uh, way that they are administered is by being mailed directly to your house. 
And another way is by picking them up from the pharmacy. If these medications are delivered to your house or picked up from the pharmacy, they come in a cold pack or basically with dry ice or some sort of freezer pack along with them because they need to be kept cold to be able to be stable. When you want to uh, uh, store these medications, you keep them in the refrigerator. When you want to take your take-home uh, sub-Q injection, you take it out of the refrigerator and let it sit out for the appropriate amount of time based on the package insert before you administer the drug, okay? And then obviously after you take that medication, you are going to have a dirty needle or a used syringe. It is important to always dispose of these uh, syringes uh, appropriately and to have sharp containers. If you have any questions regarding if you're taking your medicine correctly or if you should or take your medication or not, please contact your rheumatologist for further instructions. Okay. So we're, we're learning a lot about the management and, and really um, when you do this, you do have to be an advocate even to understand this. And for some people, that's the barrier to even try to imagine what this would be like. So one of the things that um, can also help is we've got an overview of how biologic medicines are given on the creakyjoints.org slash joint decisions. You go to that site, creakyjoints.org slash joint decisions. There are three videos and they illustrate the infusion and the injection experience. And so sometimes when you see that, that can clear up any confusion about, you know, how the medicines are given or what it might be like for you to just begin to imagine that. Now, these videos are not going to replace the training. You know, if you're going to give yourself an injection, you need that training from a healthcare provider um, in, in order to learn how to do that. This isn't going to replace that, but this is part of the education about what it's about. And two of these educational videos feature Matt Eichmann, our guest today. So, you know, if we think about that, Matt, how, how do you manage your IRA? Well, Lori, I manage my symptoms uh, via a biologic medicine that's given by infusion. And I really like uh, getting my treatment via infusion one of the main things is my schedule is crazy. I work long hours on the TV show. It takes me around the country when I'm doing comedy. Sometimes it'll take me out of the country. Uh, so for me, it's nice when I get the infusion, I go in, I can chill out, watch TV or catch up on emails. And there's a nurse there, a medical professional, who's administering the medication uh, on the physician's direction. It's a setup that's really worked well for me. Now, having said that, just because uh, a biologic treatment given by infusion works for me doesn't mean it works for you, which is why we come back to that point that you just touched on, be your own advocate. Talk to your rheumatologist, go over your symptoms and figure out what treatment's gonna work for you. Thank you, and, and now that we hear your story, I'm also curious if others on our chat are have considered taking a biologic medication and talked about it with their rheumatologist, or maybe they're even currently taking one. And so that's our next poll question. So to all of you who are on the chat, what experience do you have with the biologic medication? So you can click on, I'm currently taking one. Um, second would be, I have taken a biologic, but I'm no longer on a biologic medicine. Um, the third would be, I'm considering starting a biologic medicine. That's something my doctor and I've talked about. Four would be none of the above. So again, I'm gonna ask you to click on one of those and hit the submit. The first one, you're currently taking the biologic. The second, you've done, you've taken it, but you're no longer on a biologic. The third, you're considering it, the conversation you're having with your doctor, or fourth, none of the above. And again, don't forget to hit submit. So we've gotten this back. So 72% of you are currently taking a biologic. 12% have taken a biologic, but are no longer doing so. 8% are considering starting it, having that conversation with your physician, your rheumatologist, and 8% none of the above. So thanks for uh, giving us that background. So Dr. Callis, when should people talk to their rheumatologist about treatment with biologic medication? Good question. I talk about using biologic medications with my patients when they're not doing well on their DMARD therapy. That's those medications like methotrexate that I mentioned. Um, so we talk about that when they have still persistent swelling, uh, stiffness, and pain of the joints. 
it's important to remember that when I talk to them about the biologic medications, we once again start doing a thorough medical history review to know which medication might be the best for them and have potentially the least side effects for them. Okay. So, again, I'm just going to remind you, if you have a question, this is a good time to uh, submit it. You're going to go to that Q&A feature and um, send it to all panelists. We're going to hopefully get to a lot of these towards the end. So, Dr. Callis, you know, say somebody is talking with their rheumatologist about a biologic medicine for their RA. They've gotten to that point in their treatment. What are some factors that they should consider? So, as you can tell, a common thing is, is that I've been saying is be honest with yourself and be honest with your rheumatologist on how you're doing and your other health issues. So, one thing that I do do is I review their overall health. Are you a person who gets urinary tract infections? Do you get bronchitis easy? Do you have a history of hepatitis C? Have you been exposed to tuberculosis? Things like that make a difference on what medication we may choose. I review important safety considerations with them depending on which biologic we're talking about because like as we said, there's many different options. So I review with them what are the, the safety profile they would be the most um, comfortable with. I also review with them how biologics work. I once again, bring out my little Pac-Man model pretty often. And once again, I, I, I don't make them have a full biochemistry uh, lesson, but it is important to know that, that the way these medications work definitely comes to play on the side effect of what you see with these medications. So I want my patients to be informed with that and to understand. And then I also talk about the administration options, that being IV or sub-Q, whether or not they want to try and administer the drug themselves at home and feel okay doing that, or whether or not they'd rather have me or a hospital or infusion facility do that and feel more comfortable if somebody else was monitoring them. So together with, with all these different points, we decide what the best biologic treatment option is for them. And so what you're saying is there, there are, this is not a simple thing. There's a lot of conversation to have, which is why it's important to work on this with a rheumatologist to really understand kind of the full surround of, of what's involved in that level of treatment. So do you also review with people what somebody can expect after they start a biologic medicine? What is it that they should be thinking about or paying attention to? Yes, that's, that's a really good question. So I wish we, we gave these medicines and you were better the next day. Uh, unfortunately, their biologics are not pixie dust, so it, it doesn't work like that. But, but most biologic medications, it takes about three to four months until you have maximum benefit. Granted, some patients do get lucky and, and get earlier response to that. And, and what we're looking for is we're looking for the active rheumatoid arthritis to get better. So as we talked about in that first poll, is, is joint damage cannot be reversed or repaired with these medications, so we're looking to prevent further joint damage. That means, although we may see a reduction of stiffness, warmth, redness, and swelling, you might not have complete resolution of your joint pain, and so I try and make sure my patients definitely do understand that. And then it, it's important to remember that, you know, when you see your rheumatologist, uh, it, it's only a, a one-time small shot, uh, snapshot of, of your day and of your week and of your month. It's important that, that you're honest with your rheumatologist and tell us if you think it's working. You know, when you do your daily activities, you actually notice the reduction of swelling or pain. So be honest with us and let us know if you think you're getting treatment response or not. Right, and you know, that's one of the things we talked about in our last chat, that sometimes it's hard to remember, so that writing it down and, and there is a, a tracker, a symptom tracker on the creakyjoints.org slash joint decisions, if you go to that site, because sometimes, you know, I don't remember how it was last week or three days ago, so many things have happened. So in order to really give that honest, authentic feedback, keeping track is probably a, an important piece of it. So you've just given us a, a great overview, Dr. Callis, of, of how, how that medication might work. Matt, can you talk a little bit more about how you monitored your symptoms after you started a biologic therapy? Yeah, when I first started the therapy, uh, the key thing that I always tried to keep in mind was how I felt before the therapy. Mm -hmm. And I remember there were days where I had trouble even getting out of bed. And over time, as I was on this therapy, I realized 
I was noticing an improvement. It really kind of felt like a veil was being lifted. But everyone is going to measure success differently. For some people, a, a huge victory is going to be able to pick up your kid or just go for a walk after dinner. So that's why it's so important, though, for you to track it and, and have concrete information so you can notice the progress. Because, again, just like the onset of the disease, sometimes uh, your improvements can be gradual. And so I think it's really important for you to be your advocate and, and to keep a log of these things so you can really see the progress and be more objective about it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. That's helpful for everybody to keep in mind and consider, you know, you're managing your preconceptions and then you're managing what's actually happening. It's, it's a lot of work, um, but it, it seems that um, there's payoff for it. So before we get to the question and answer portion of the discussion, Matt, what, what do you want people to take away from this chat tonight? Well, look, I know I'm fortunate that I've found a treatment that really works to control my RA. And I, I just hope that people who are out there watching this will take this opportunity and work closely with their rheumatologist. Again, be your advocate and work with this doctor uh, to find a therapy that works for you. And don't be afraid to tell your rheumatologist if you're not getting uh, the response that you want, if you don't feel the medication is working for you. There are so many treatment options out there. There's no need to suffer stoically or, or in silence. So be an advocate, speak out, work with your rheumatologist, and you, that's the way you'll get the best results battling this disease. You know, I want to just add a big amen to that. You know, some people I work with feel like they're going to disappoint their rheumatologist. <laughs> um, it's not working, you know, that their rheumatologist will feel like a failure, so they're trying to protect them, so they don't they don't want to say, gosh, it's not working. But, you know, to hear you say, and I'm sure Dr. Kalish, you would emphasize this, you really do need to say, this works well, this not so much, what can we do? And the fact that we have this range of options of medications is, is just so wonderful. So thank you both for um, really opening this up and giving us such great information. So we're, we're going to turn now to um, our, our questions that you have sent in. Um, and so, I'm going to start with this one, and I, this this is um, not surprising. Dr. Callis, can you tell us a little bit about the side effects of biologic medications? Uh, yes, it's, it's kind of hard. There's very there's many varying side effects depending on which biologic medication you choose. So it's kind of hard to answer that that question in a whole. But like I talked about before, it's important to have the adequate blood screening and sometimes X-ray screening, depending on which one you're going to have. It's important to talk about the potential side effects with your doctor, to look at the, uh, the, the, the drug package insert medication side effects, and many of these biologic medications have good websites where you can find a full list of the side effects of them, too. Okay, great, thanks. Matt, this next one's for you. You know, we've been trying to really emphasize that word manage tonight. You talked about your medication. What else do you do to manage your RA? Well, exercise has always been a big part of my life, working out. I've, I'm a lifelong athlete. I played baseball in college. And after, uh, during the onset of RA, I, I almost eliminated all activity. I mean, I was barely, getting out of bed was considered my workout at that point. But once I started treatment and got my symptoms under control, I worked with my rheumatologist and figured out a way to get exercise back into my life. And now, I'm very active. I've made some modifications. I, I won't do high-impact exercising like jogging. It's a little hard on my feet, but what I've found is I've replaced it with things like yoga and Pilates and swimming, these low-impact exercises that I wish I would have known about before I had RA. So, again, the key is to find something that works for you and work with your rheumatologist. Can you say a little bit, Dr. Callis, about the cost of biologic medications? Yes, the, the cost of biologic medications varies, obviously. It varies depending on your insurance coverage, whether or not your Medicare or private insurance plan. It depends on if you get the medicine by vein or by sub-Q. And then it also depends on different copay support programs. So these biologic medications, most of them do have copay support programs. And it's important to ask your rheumatologist or your rheumatologist office about those for assistance. I also want to point out that as part of this joint decision series, the next chat that we're actually having is about pharmacy and medical support programs. So I tune in to get some more information about that. 
Thank you, that's really helpful. So uh, Matt was talking about exercise and now we've got a question. There's a lot in the media about diet and RA. You know, what are your thoughts on that research, Dr. Callis? Uh, diet and RA, so, so there's been no fantastic study that has proven statistically benefit that diet alters the immune system. So to kind of make that a little bit easier, there's, there's no study that has proven that any diet will actually decrease the activity of the immune system or help control the rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, anecdotally, I do have many patients who tell me they feel better on different diets, but uh, anecdotally, I can't tell you that I've seen one common diet that they're finding the best relief from. So unfortunately, I, I can't give any positive scientific results when it comes to diet modification for control of your disease. Okay, but do you discuss nutrition with your patients when you're talking with them about treatment options and managing their RA? So I, I do discuss nutrition with my patients. When it comes to treatment options of many different uh, DMARDs or biologic medications, I can't tell them that certain diets are going to make those medicines work better or worse or have side effects. So th that's one part of the question. Um, I do definitely review diet, like when people are on prednisone, which can make their sugars go up or make their diabetes worse. And we try and stay away from complex carbohydrates and sugars in those instances. But um, otherwise, no, there's no specific recommendations handed down by the American College of Rheumatology of what to do diet-wise. If, if you are doing certain types of dedicated diet or herbal supplements and things like that, definitely you need to tell your rheumatologist many herbal, herbal supplements can increase or decrease the effectiveness or even the toxicity of some of the drugs that we give. So it's really important we know if you are going to take those meds. So that's a great piece of advice and something else to put in the tracker that you might forget to mention, but that if you're taking it, your, your rheumatologist really needs to know that. So here's another question, Dr. Kels. Why do symptoms like pain, stiffness, fatigue continue even when the lab tests come back normal? Ooh, good question. I like that one, lab tests. Okay, so I can get to be a super dork when it comes to lab tests. But long story short, when you look at lab tests, nothing's 100% in uh, rheumatology or immunology. Unfortunately, this day and age, we cannot get all the information we want out of your blood. So to start off with, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you might have positive blood work for rheumatoid arthritis, or you might not. So having negative rheumatoid factor CCP or 1433, which are the three blood tests we do to, to uh, diagnose rheumatoid, doesn't guarantee that you don't have it. Having negative blood tests, you can still have the disease, okay? okay. Another thing that I think you're asking about is um, when you say, how come you still have inflammation despite the fact that blood tests are negative, you're probably talking about your inflammatory markers, such as your ESR or your CRP. Those are proteins in your bloodstream that can, in some people, not everybody, correlate with the amount of inflammation in your system. So once again, not everybody's disease activity tracks with that blood work. And that's why physical exam is so important, and it's not just blood work that tells us how good your rheumatoid arthritis is doing. Okay. So the blood work is just simply one piece of it, and your blood work might look normal even though you're still having symptoms because there are other factors that the blood work doesn't pick up? Yes, exactly true. And then what you're looking for with treatment, like we talked about before, is you're looking for reduction of the immune system or the goo actually physically in the joint. So you might have persistent pain after the rheumatoid or the goo is out of the joint because of the damage done. Rheumatoid eats away at padding, so therefore you can think about it like speeding up osteoarthritis or making the joint older than what it should be. So even when we get the active goo or rheumatoid out of there, the joint is damaged and therefore you may have persistent pain because of the damage already done. And that's why it's so important for early diagnosis and treatment of rheumatoid arthritis to prevent that damage. Okay, so that you could have those symptoms even if your RA isn't particularly active or, or the, it has been, the inflammation has been controlled or the further destruction, but you're still going to have to manage some pain. Yeah, yes, exactly. And, and what some of you might realize when you go to your rheumatologist is your rheumatologist might do a joint count, which means look at your hands and feet 
and, and see what joints are uh, either warm and swollen or painful. You know, because the warm and swollen counts when we're talking about altering meds, but the painful doesn't always count because it might be damaged, not always active disease. Okay, wow. So there's just so much to consider. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, almost another part-time job to take care of monitoring your symptoms. But what I'm hearing you say is when you do that, when you work with your rheumatologist, you can get um, with these new medications and also with the ongoing treatment some relief from that. Yes, yes. Our, our goal is always relief. We can't ever guarantee 100% control of the arthritis with any treatment that we have available today. But you're looking for a significant reduction of symptoms and for a significant stagnation or slowing down of the accumulation of damage. Yeah, wow. So, Matt, as you're listening to all this and, you know, you've been a part of this discussion in the last one, I'm sure you've had a chance to think, you know, what advice would you give to patients? Be informed, be active, be your own advocate, work with your rheumatologist, and take part in your care. Again, this is your life, and you are the one who needs to help drive the boat along with your rheumatologist. It's, it's a partnership here in managing your RA. Yeah. And one of the things I'm really also learning from these chats is there's still so much to learn with the new treatments, with the things that are happening. So... So managing and that learning along with, you know, learning from your rheumatologist, from the research you do, it can make a difference. Dr. Callis, what, what kind of advice do you want patients to go away with tonight? I want you to know that there are many treatment options and don't get discouraged if the first medication that you and your rheumatologist choose is not effective. The, the hardest thing about my job, I ha I'd have to say, is telling people to try a medication and waiting three to four months to see if it's effective. And they, they do get discouraged when the first one they take is not as beneficial as they, would, as they would hope. So don't get discouraged. Be honest with your rheumatologist. Tell them you're not getting the resolution of symptoms to the point that you are happy with. The, the uh, second thing I want to point out is Definitely be honest. I, I greatly appreciate that, that, yes, I agree with what Dr. Ferguson was saying. Sometimes patients feel bad when they tell me they're not doing well, like I'll be disappointed. But no, the biggest compliment I can have is you being honest with me and telling me if you're getting better. And if you're getting better, fantastic. But if not, I want you to tell me so we can discuss other medications. And, and third and lastly, it's yes, definitely education is the key when it comes to knowing about everything from the disease, the, the manifestations that can happen because of this disease, even things outside of the joints and stuff like that, and when it comes to your medications. So good job for logging on and good job for, for educating yourself about the disease and the treatment. Great, and I guess the thing that I would also wanna say is um, one of the things that can start to feel like is overwhelming information and, and overwhelm that you have to be the constant learner. I always encourage the people I work with to have you know, a partner or a sense of team, you know, maybe you've got a friend or a family member who loves to learn and do research and they can help you. Or, you know, maybe there's someone else that you can bring in to the doctor's appointment with you to help you keep track of those symptoms. So I guess my takeaway would be as you are managing this disease and managing your life, um, be sure that you include others who love you and care about you and want to be a part of it. So I also want to acknowledge before we close that, you know, during the Q&A, we have gotten um, some personal questions about treatment decisions. Some of you are obviously really um, trying to get some information and, and learn about those, and we really want to encourage you to have that frank conversation with your rheumatologist so that you together with your doctor can make those decisions. So thank you for asking. Thank you for, for you know, as Dr. Callis and Matt said, locking on and being part of this. But we really would encourage you um, to take that the next step to talk with your rheumatologist. So thanks, everyone, for being here. And thanks especially to Matt Eisman and Dr. Callis for giving us their expertise and their experience. And we've got two more exciting web chats to come. In a few weeks, um, as Dr. Callis mentioned, we're going to tackle some important questions about health insurance coverage. 
um, some things to help you with the open enrollment process, and we're going to share with you some ways to make the treatment with biologic medications more affordable. So please be sure to log on for that. And then we're going to continue in January with a conversation about how to stay on track to successfully manage your RA. And we're going to point you, um, we're going to continue to point you to some great resources that are going to help you with medication cost assistance. So uh, I just want to remind you again, head on over to creakyjoints.org slash joint decisions. Um, register to be a member of our community, and that also is a place where you can register for the upcoming chats and get notification that they're happening. And there are also those tools and resources, including the videos that we mentioned, that could help you become a more informed advocate with your RA. So Matt, thank you. Thanks, Lori. And uh, just a reminder, uh, today's chat and all the joint decisions chats are going to be posted on creakyjoints.org slash joint decisions. 